Good afternoon, everyone. You have to <coughs> excuse my voice a bit. Good old back to school sicknesses always occur after the holidays. So, um, yeah, I'm really honoured to, to be here for you guys today. And and going through this, it's it's really great to see a lot of keen people interested in geography. I know we've suffered a lot with the the national the old curriculum having to deal with all the Australian stuff. So it's it's really exciting to be part of a new new wave of, of geography coming forward and and everyone being here is a I think a really good idea of, of seeing how we can improve geography and try and build up our numbers in the especially in the senior senior school. So what I wanted to do was go through a, a simple sort of structure with you guys today. Um, the first bit I wanted to go through was just have a look at breaking down the syllabus because I know some people might have been to conferences and things and seen the new adaptations in the syllabus. It's very different to the old one. So I wanted to go through some of those key things with people. Some people might know those and some mightn't. So I thought I'd just hedge my bets and, and go through it quickly. So if people don't know it, then they'll get that. And then go through ways in which to program it because there was some feedback from, from people that wanted to talk about how to do some programming stuff and, and what to sort of look for. Then we've, what we've done is we've broken it into each stage and we've broken it down into each of the, the key topics and just given you some tips and tricks on, on how to approach teaching those, those sort of areas. And then towards the end, Cambridge have developed a, a really incredible resource in terms of it ties everything together, the textbook, integrated learning, uh, assessment tasks, everything all in the one-stop shop. There's programs, there's scope and sequences, everything's in that. So I wanted to, to go through that with you so that you can see how good that product is and so when you see the textbook and how it seamlessly integrates with the teaching resource, pretty much you won't have to do a lot of programming to help you. So it's always good for that. So what I wanted to go through first is just the syllabus structure. Obviously, the big change with the syllabus now, <coughs> and I went to a conference last year, and it didn't hit me until the, the lady who was pretty much the one in charge of writing it said, this is the first syllabus geography written that has not had an external examination attached to it. So when you think about it, there's no school certificate, no nothing now for these for these people. So they have really revolutionised the way the syllabus is, is, is set out. And the key thing is that you have dot points and you have dash points. And the key thing with it is that the dot point is the only thing that's compulsory. So if you want to go into teaching this, the syllabus, the only thing you have to really cover is the dot point. The dash points are there as a guide for you. And if you feel comfortable, you can use those as a guide and program and teach those things as you, as you want. But they are not mandatory. Like the previous syllabus we're still working under, everything was a dot point and everything had to be touched. Okay? It was like a ticker box. You had to tick everything off, ready for the school certificate, make sure it's all done. Oh. And so you've got a range of things that you have to be able to do now and it gives you that flexibility to work through. So when you see that there, you can see that the example I've got is out of the landscapes topic. So you can see the red section is the only thing that you have to be able to teach. I know for, for me personally, being in an independent school, we, we have to go through accreditation and registration. So you have to make sure that you cover that point. but the other things are optional, so you don't, don't have to worry too much about it if you don't want to. So that's the first major thing that's different. The second thing that's, that's a big change with it is the first point in every syllabus, and it starts with the word investigate. And this is a really a revolutionary change for geography. If you go back and have a look at your old syllabus now, you'll see that there's a whole range of different things now, different words that are put in there to, to tell you what, what to teach. Especially in that Australian version, you just had little points that told you what you had to teach. Now, they've given you the word investigate. Every syllabus point starts with the word investigate. 
And what this is trying to do is a, it's a major pedagogical shift. It's really encouraging that inquiry-based learning. And this, is, this has come a lot from the history syllabus. And unfortunately for us, we sort of follow the history. So what they do, we sort of do. But it's really encouraging you to be more student-centred with your teaching. It's really encouraging you to say, righto, here's this point, here's this information. We want you to go and investigate it rather than you standing, chalk and talk, this is what you have to do, dot point, tick it all off as you go through. So it's, it's really, really changed the way in which you start to learn and plan what you're teaching. And especially for us at Riverview, we've, we've spent a fair bit of time debating and going through and planning a lot of the stuff for the national curriculum. And we've found it being so refreshing that we just can go and do whatever we want in terms of that syllabus point and go wherever we want. We're not confined by that, that structure that we've been used to. So in, in saying that, I'm, I'm really, really positive in terms of how the syllabus writers have, have rewritten this, this whole syllabus. It's, it's really, really good. And that's the key thing, this inquiry based. <clears throat> if you have a look, I've printed out for you guys, I put a syllabus document there so everyone had a copy of it today. If you have a look at any of the, any of the topics, every topic has, I think it's about three, three to four inquiry questions written into it. So that's there ready for you to put that in and develop an inquiry based approach to that part of the course. So you can then go in and design a unit of work around two or three inquiry questions and give the kids that scope to go off and, in, and give them the, the freedom to go and look at the, the, the syllabus in a range of different ways. So it is really, really, <coughs> sorry, really positive in terms of being able to go where you want to. Okay? It's giving us freedom to do what we want to do with geography. It's not being stuck in an Australian version of geography or doing the, th the things with the stage four, we have that, we have that freedom to, to go through. The other thing I wanted to, to go through with you guys is draw your attention to the geographical concepts, inquiry skills and tools that are, that are in the, the syllabus. And you can find these, I've put the page numbers up there, so if you, if you wanted to have a look at them as we go through. Geographical concepts is a really, really new one, okay? And it's, it's actually pretty exciting. It's, when you start to look at these concepts, it's, it really marries in well with inquiry-based learning because you can then throw these sort of concepts at your kids, give them an, an, a, an issue or a a problem in geography and then throw these sort of concepts into it to say, well, how does this affect the place or how does this affect the space or how does this affect the environment? You can maybe put two or three concepts together and ask kids to look at this issue in regards to these two issue, the, the two concepts. And they're really, really, they're really key to making sure that you can get the kids to think about something in a different perspective. And that's what geography is about, is getting kids to see things in different perspectives, looking at it from different scales and being able to understand what's going on around them. And so these concepts, they've got, if you have a look at the, the stuff in the syllabus, it has a lot of key things in there that give you some ideas of how you can use it. But they're really, really key to, and what we've done, especially when we've done the programming for this, is use these as little stimulus for lessons and ideas in lessons. You base an idea or a lesson around one of these themes and say, here's something about an issue. So you can look at landscapes and landforms as part of that topic. Well, how does this impact on the environment? How does this impact? So you could look at mountains, for example. You could look at the degradation occurring in the Himalayas or somewhere like that. How does this affect the environment? and use these concepts to, to help you with it. The next one, the inquiry skills.
is again breaking down that inquiry methodology into certain characteristics and it's it's giving you information about <coughs> pardon me about what sort of things you want to do with inquiry so it's giving you a, a checklist of things that you can use in terms of the inquiry process what sort of skills are you getting the kids to do how are you trying to get them to do that so it's it's giving you little tips and tricks on how to integrate these things into your into your teaching and that's the that's the big push from my perspective especially is is really pushing the boundaries with kids pushing the kids into different ways into a, a global environment that we're looking at the last one <coughs> is the geographical tools and the big thing with this one is you're using sorry under the old syllabus you had your little toolbox where you had to tick off every skill in each unit there is no mandated skills that you have to teach in terms of each stage they give you these as a guide but there's no ticker box to say you have to teach this 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 and this there's a continuum if you turn over on the page <coughs> page 28 it gives you a continuum and it tells you these are the types of skills that should be should be able to be achieved and as geographers we need to integrate a lot of these things into to what we teach but there's no it's, it's a little bit different to how it was set up previously so you have the freedom to put the skills wherever you see fit into your teaching and into your planning and into your lessons so you don't have to teach these things in each topic you can teach them wherever you feel fr free to put them in if you want to put maps and things in landscapes or if you want to put it in biomes or whatever topic you want to put it into it's your job as the teacher to work out where it best, best fits into it so again there's that freedom of, of choice for what you need to do in terms of geography it's it's giving you a lot more freedom than what you've had previously so that's pretty much that's pretty much the uh, introduction to the syllabus 101 in five minutes so if you ha if you need to have more information about this please come and come and have a chat to me or you've got your your board reps and those sort of people that will be able to go through things with you but again there's so much so much freedom for you guys to do this in terms of how you're going to integrate it in it's it's really exciting obviously the next one I wanted to go through was programming the probably the the baddest word in in teaching is having to do the old programs but in saying that it's actually been quite quite enjoyable to go through and start to do these programming and and work out how we're going to teach this new curriculum <coughs> so like I've said before you've got this freedom so why not use it really challenge yourself as a teacher and challenge yourself in your faculties to, to come up with the best way to teach geography really most interesting way the big thing for me and the big thing for my staff is I've pushed the global perspective on them I said we've been stuck with the we've been stuck with the Australian curriculum or the Australian geography so much we push it up push push the geography into the global perspective really push the kids in terms of use an understanding of global examples rather than using Australian examples because we've really got to have that global perspective of kids to to really encourage them to to develop that understanding of the world not just we live in Australia yes we we've, we've got all these key characteristics but and the syllabus has been written quite well in terms of their they develop an understanding of Australian geography but then they do a lot of comparative studies this is what happens in Australia now compare that with somewhere else in the world so when you're doing your programming really push yourselves to make geography the best it can be 
For us, where we started from was obviously worked out our timetable structure. Okay, for us at, at Riverview, we have <coughs> both in our um, stage four and stage five, we have three lessons a week. So what we did was break it down into, we've got three lessons a week and then started to plan our scope and sequence from there. Work out, well, how many lessons are we going to have in a term and what are we going to do in terms of sort of a lesson by lesson sort of sequence. And what we've developed is a scope and sequence so that it puts it all together. And the, the word of advice for you guys is once you start planning it, you'll realise that there's not enough time for it, okay? When I, when I saw the first draft of, of the geography syllabus, it was massive and I knew that there was going to be too much in it. And so they've ended up cutting a whole heap out but trust me, once you get this free reign and you're in there planning these lessons and going to these far off locations, you're going to run out of time very, very quickly. And that's probably the other point I will tell you, that there's no mandated time allocation for each of the units. You can teach the unit for as long as you want, but you just have to make sure you cover all the syllabus points in stage four or stage five. So if you want to do water in the world for two terms, don't know why you would, but if you wanted to, there's, there's nothing stopping you. So you can use as much time or as little time as what you see fit. So you've got that flexibility as well. But again, in saying that, it, once you start to put it all together and actually when you start to see some of the syllabus points, especially in the water and world topic, there's some complexity to it. And for you to address every aspect of the syllabus, it will take you a fair bit of time. And that's what we've developed. We've developed this <coughs> in terms of breaking it down into a lesson sequence which then equates to weeks. And when you start to put it all in place, yeah, it, it gets pretty tight. Because we all know in schools, the athletics carnival and the assembly and the, this gets involved in, in your teaching. So when you start to work out that this is a basic plan of what you're going to do, take out a few assemblies and things like that, you start losing lessons, it's, it's, it gets pretty hard. And so what we've done for each unit, we've mapped it out like this and we've mapped it out so that we know where it all sort of fits and how much timing because when you start going into the planning and programming of it, as long as you know the time frame of what you're dealing with, you're then going to be able to plan your lessons and what you want to achieve in each of those lessons. So for us it's been a really valuable way of planning it. So all my staff have done the a scope and sequence for each of the, each of the topics they're in charge of and they've started to work on, on all the programming and stuff now. So I'm not saying this is the only way to do it. I'm just saying this is the way that we've done it and this is a, a, a good way to starting point because you put all this together, then as a group you start to program and say, well, right, I've got this amount of lessons for this. And in all honesty, guys, it's, it's a working document, okay? This looks totally different to the first version that we had, okay? We had, I think from memory, we had more up in the water cycle I think we had two weeks or three weeks up in the water cycle, but then when we got into it, we realised that the water cycle is pretty, pretty straightforward. There's not that much to it. So, and then when you start to get down to water scarcity and water management and the value of water, the syllabus points get pretty complex down there. There's really, really detailed syllabus points. So we needed more time there. So we took the time out of there, moved it down. So. It's a good little working document to have in terms of planning it all out and then that gives your staff a good idea to write I've got this many lessons to do this one, this many to do this one and then you can start to write your program and lessons and stuff based on that. So it's a, it's a really good little way to, to start it off. Obviously when you're doing your program you've got to write in all the integrations Sorry, you've got to integrate all the tools and skills, concepts and all those sort of things into it. So what, what we've done is 
I've written a program especially just for the water in the world topic and what I've done is when you have a look at it you can see there's some integration of the different things in it okay so again you've got to come up with your own templates and things like that the the Cambridge guys have got programs and stuff there for you this is a little bit different to it but it gives you the same sort of structure and, and those sort of things but I wanted to really show you guys how you can integrate those concepts and those sort of things into, into your teaching. It's obviously not the best data projector. But what I've got there, you can see up the top, up here, visual representation is one of the, the key skill or tools that you've got in the, in the tool section. So what we've got is a, a stimulus material, you've got a, a diagram and the kids have to then go and outline the key characteristics of that diagram. So it's a visual representation. So there's a skill ticked off already just by interpreting one diagram. So you can start to tick things off quite quickly when you start to plan your syllabus around what you're going to teach. <coughs> one of the big things for us is spatial technology. And so Google Maps is a great tool to, to have to, to use that. So again, we're integrating that spatial technology, which is another skill. So the first couple of strategies we've had for that, this section, we've ticked off two of our skills already. You've got, once they develop the map, then they obviously have to then interpret what are some of the things that they've done. They've compiled all their map, put all their information on the map, and then they have to interpret that information and put it together as a, as a written task. So again, you're encouraging their literacy strategies, but then you're also encouraging their interpretation strategies of a map. So you can start to see as you go through, you can really integrate your skills and tools and those sort of things into your teaching relatively easy. So as you go down, you've got another stimulus information, interpretation, sorry. Obviously, teacher exposition is teacher directed, teacher doing a discussion in class or giving, putting information on the board and getting the kids to interpret some information. And then what we've done down the bottom, and I encourage people, it might be a bit of my OCD, but using colours and things like that to really illustrate key parts of your, your syllabus. So if a teacher picks up that program, What's what going to be the one of the first things they're going to see? Is that, that visual information, oh, concept, righto, what's that? So then they have to study the pictures <coughs> and explain the interaction of people and the water cycle, identify and explain. So you've got that interconnection. Why do these things, why does the, thing, why does the water cycle rely on each component? So you've got that inter, interconnection, why does that happen? So you, you're developing that concept, you're getting the kids to understand well, one thing's related to another. If something happens to that part, what's going to happen to this next part? And it happens a lot. So when you do the biomes topic as well, interconnections is really popular as well because you've got all those cycles and, and functionings of biomes and what goes on. So you've got a range of different things there that you can use when you're programming and writing. And it's, that's a very simple, basic sort of program. Okay, so it's, it's just something that encourages you to think about what you're teaching but then think about well, what are the skills that we need to look at and how can I integrate those into, into my teaching. So it, it makes it a little bit simpler but again, it's just a, again, this is just one way of doing it. It's just giving you guys some ideas to think about. So when you go home to your faculty or go back to your faculty, you can say, well, I've got this idea, how am I going to do this? It's just giving you some extra information. Obviously the programs in your, they've got some, some draft programs in your, in your book from Cambridge, in your, sorry, in your pack. And that's there to, to really show you how you can integrate those programs into, into what you're teaching. And the good thing about the book, and I might be a bit biased, but the book is really good in terms of there's a lot of stimulus in there. 
There's a lot of photos, there's a lot of graphs, there's a lot of diagrams, there's a lot of things in the book that will really assist you in terms of understanding the concepts and the, the terminology. And again, we're all in the same boat. We're all starting from scratch again. So the more we can share and the more we can talk about things, the easier it is. So when you look at this, the stuff in the, the book, it's going to make your programming things so much easier because there's so much stimulus in there that you can use. And that's what is going to make your programming that much easier because you can use that stimulus, refer to this stimulus and ask the kids to interpret that information and move on from there. So have a good read through the programs. Uh, they really relate to the book especially, so it makes it, I suppose, it gives you a starting point as well to see how the program's written based on information from the book. Okay? Has anyone got any questions with that so far? Yep. Are we going to get this password twice? Oh, I'm not sure. <laughs> Depends how much you want to pay us. <laughs> Do you differentiate your programming? Because I noticed that there wasn't, like, for example, four stuff in the extension, or you just have the one program? We have the one program, but we've got a very strong um, learning support staff. So what we do is we, s we have our set program and then we differentiate it for, for the needs of those kids. So we base it upon that. Just on uh, page 77, it, it talks about um, just above the dot point. Uh, it says select one type of environment in Australia as a context for a comparative study. Yep. Assuming that's mandatory as well. Yeah. Yeah, so that's where you, um, you've got to identify, and that, I'll go through that a bit later and, and show you some stuff with that. Everyone happy with that? Okay, I'll pass over to Christina now and she'll go through the stage four. That one. <coughs> okay, so stage four geography. So when we do it, we have we teach geography for all of year eight. So we don't teach any geography in year seven. So that's why when you sort of look three, it seems a lot. We're only doing it in that one year group. Um, so in terms of stage four, the topics include landscapes and landforms, place and livability, water in the world and interconnection. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through each of the different topics, talk about a range of the different activities that we've got um, in the programs from Cambridge, how it marries up, with the book, the different types of sources. Um, as Rex was saying, I will make comments in regard to a lot of the diagrams are really useful that you can use as a basis of an activity. So we've done different things from see, think, wonder as a visible thinking and use that as a basis that kids can look at, say whether it's a photo interpretation to look at slums or different things. So landscapes and landforms, okay? When we were doing landscapes and landforms, um, we were trying to sort of make it quite practical and so we used different relevant examples in terms of Christchurch earthquakes um, but also getting them to look at the Japan earthquake and tsunami um, and getting them to make comparisons. For this topic you can see that as a basis start off by doing things at what are the different types of landscapes and landforms um, around the world. So we had different mapping activities um, and where they had to look at where major volcanic eruptions occurred and different things like that. Um, in terms of value, um, here's where we typed, um, tied in the idea of Aboriginal perspective. So we actually had them looking at um, a comparison between how Aboriginals um, actually go and value their landscapes and compare that to how people in Hawaii compare their landscapes. Um, we also had quite a lot of the way through linking with things like the Great Barrier Reef, so quite relevant case studies that you can use, um, that still you can use the book as a source and then tie in like a recent article or something that's occurred recently. Um, in terms of management and protection, and I know you sort of feel like it's a little bit overkill and you've used it so many times, but still going back, using the things in the book, but also going and looking at the World Heritage Listing, okay? It's still your perfect example where you can go get the kids onto the UN website, get them to research, 
different um, landscapes, how have they been managed, what sites are World Heritage listed and what ones aren't. Um, and in terms of the geomorphic hazard, we actually use that idea of Jap Japan's earthquake and the tsunami as an example. A lot of the kids, it's relevant, they know about it, they've seen it. Just starting off by showing that video that you'll find on YouTube that shows the tsunami coming in and then using that as a basis of discussion to then be able to get the kids to research, use the resources from the book and as well as their own independent learning. Um, main teaching notes to think of with this. Um, what you've got to do is you've got to look at a range of the different types of landscapes, okay? So at a range of different scales and look at the different processes. So whether that's going and getting the kids to um, look at, select a few of the different ones and then getting them to write by, identify what are the steps that occurred for that occur to occur or not, um, how you do it, it's up to you. Um, other things, so link in a range of different case studies. So for example, Sherpas, Nepal, um, and then you can get that economic, aesthetic, cultural and spiritual link. This also does tie in a little bit with water when you look at that uh, whole idea of what's an aesthetic value. So if you can sort of set that up early and the definitions of what aesthetic and cultural values, it sort of ties in across the whole course. Um, also, um, using a case study to understand human impact, so whether it be Great Barrier Reef or Himalayas and tourism, um, and that geomorphic hazard. Place and livability. I have to say, this is probably my favourite topic in creating. There's so much that you can go in terms of spatial technology mapping tasks that you can do. And the book has heaps of maps that you can go in, you can get kids to interpret, but also photos. And I had one of the tasks that I did, they had simply photos of different um, environments in terms of uh, slums somewhere, they had housing in another place, in three different places they had pictures of housing. And I actually got the, in one of the activities them to do a see, think, wonder where they had to actually make comparisons and draw out similarities and differences between what are the different styles of housing. And I actually, um, in the thing, had a table where they actually had to describe what are the different characteristics. Are they overcrowded? Is it well managed? Is it what materials are being used? And they could use those visual resources to actually gain a better understanding and it was them thinking for themselves. Um, so place and livability. Um, in terms of influence and perceptions, um, for things like that, we actually had, looking at how climate and different things impacts upon where people live. So Cairns, anywhere hot, tropical, perfect example. So that whole idea that people move there. Um, and for retirement and different aspects like that. So even that's a great point that you can go start embedding climate um, graphs and getting them to draw climate graphs. And there's actually a couple of points across stage four that are really good for climate graphs. Um, access to services and facilities. This is a really good way that you can use Google My Maps. So there's a few different things in the book that talks about different resources and where they come from. Use that as your starting point. Then when you start looking at things like um, resources, get them to see a different resource that's in the book, pick one of those resources and then get them to go and physically create a map, map it, see where it's found and then also get them to annotate in a different colour where maybe the map is actually um, where it's sold to, where the resource is sold to, sorry. Um, also in terms of, and jumping back to influences and perceptions, um, Cabra Matter is also a good case study that's been done. Um, and Cabra Matter is really good in terms of it goes through, yes, it's got a lot of background, but if you go and look and at uh, Cabra Matter today, you can actually go down, use Google Street View, jump in there, um, see what the streets, what the houses, and there's actually things like transect activities that are in there that the kids can actually, um, it's got a table, it's all set, the kids can go in, you move through different street views, see what are the different houses, look at what are the products that they sell? What is the signage? What is the language that they use? Um, so there's a whole range of different things like that that you can use in mapping particularly. Um, so, and yeah, environmental quality. Um, so community also linking back to that cover matter idea. Um, 
but also um, different things where you get kids to look at what is the community that they're in, what is it like, um, getting them to look at, so once you sort of do the whole topic, getting them, the kids to then think about what is their community like, is it livable, so at the end a good summative thing to, for them is if they go and sort of plot out what access to facilities are in their community, um, there's a few good data sets in there that they can actually use to compare communities um, in general, but get them to have that gauge of what is maybe a livable community, what makes a community livable, and then make it real world to them and get them to sort of assess as to whether they feel or how livable their community is. Um, so, yes, it is subjective. Yes, you will get all the stereotypical views of everyone. Yes, come to expect it. Um, but I think also a good thing about this topic is maybe getting the students to sort of explain what something means to them, okay? Um, getting, if you've got an Indigenous student to, in your class to talk about, even with this topic, or the landscapes and landforms, what their community values are and what it means to them, okay? Getting someone who lives, if you've got a school and you've got people coming from different areas, getting that whole idea of sharing um, within the classroom. Um, yes, you sort of do need to provide a clear definition at the onset um, in terms of what they deem as livability, as livable. Um, you'll sort of have them going off on maybe sort of, I would, in terms of that, give them set definitions of place, get them to brainstorm as a class first what they think it means, and then as a class, as a teacher, construct a definition that you guys will use. Use that as a starting point because it's going to help you later on and a range of different examples. And you'll see like throughout the book there's numerous tables with your data. You can embed all the data tables into chloroplast maps, create maps that they can be interactive and they can see spatial patterns and trends. Okay, water in the world. As you can see, I'm very Google Maps orientated, so I'll mention it quite a few times. Um, so water in the world was sort of our onset topic. And this is what we sort of started with. So even when we were looking at it, we were looking at how could we embed some of those base skills. So here, for example, we embedded the idea of climate graphs and getting students to compare different climates around the world to look at what was different people's access to water in terms of looking at the precipitation. Um, again, plotting Google My Maps. Um, but also we then incorporated a range of different case studies. So looking at Australia's water resources, so things like the Murray-Darling Basin is a really good prime example of something that you can use. It's still relevant today. Um, yeah. Other things in terms of um, the value of water is one that I'm going to focus a little bit on. Um, in terms of when we did that, you're in the program and you'll see the programs in front of you. Um, we even used different case studies, so like the Mekong that the students won't know much about, um, but it sort of gives them an eye-opening experience as to what other people use their water around the world and how they use it. Um, we also had different things like the United Arab Emirates, where we had students actually going in and getting um, through Google Earth, going down, scrolling around, looking at what is the highest point, what access to water is there, and actually getting them to do a comparative essay that they compared um, Singapore to U UAE in terms of how did they actually manage water supplies. Two places with high population, but how were they actually able to do it? So teaching notes. Um, yeah, so again, characteristic spatial de um, technology is really useful. Um, water cycle. Um, how detailed you do will depend on your ability of your class. Um, in terms of water resources, it's really good to do those comparative studies, so whether you compare Australia to another country. Um, and you'll notice that we did that basis notes of UAE and how they've been able to manage their water as well as the Mekong. Um, and yeah, so that whole idea, the reason we chose the Mekong is you'll notice in the thing, it does say from Asia. Um, or I think it's Asia or somewhere, another region. So Asia and the Mekong seem to fit really well. Um, and then hazards, um, for the hazard, there's a really great case study in the textbook on hazards of which the work was based on. 
uh, interconnections. Okay. Interconnections is a topic that you can sort of go and have freedom to sort of go anywhere. You can look at each of the different areas, four areas separately, or you can look at them and overarching, but it is quite hard. So I would suggest if you're going to do it on, say, you've got eight weeks of term left, do something where you do like a two-week focus on tourism, two weeks looking at exports and trade, two weeks looking at um, the um, lost and can't think, but two weeks where you look at each of the different topics and you can sort of give them like a really good snapshot of what are the different <coughs> areas of in interconnections. So personal connections. Um, this links in so well with tourism travel. Um, so getting kids, whether they map travel patterns of themselves or where people travel around the world, um, getting them to flo create flow um, maps where they can actually plot and using different data. So whether you go and get them to look at pop moving or somewhere and actually create their own sort of flow maps that they can go in and show where movements of people and how many people move from one place to the next. Um, whether you go fun and let them create like a tourist campaign or something like that to sort of, I guess, iconize, uh, I, okay, sorry, um, to sort of go and sort of give them an idea of creativity and an outlet where they can pick a place in the world and they can sort of create like a campaign or something like that. Um, technology, um, in terms of technology, good things with technology is looking at I guess where people are and I know technology does actually overlap a little bit with place and livability so some of the things are overarching but even technology of comparing old to new technology looking at what previous technology was used um, in terms of and even things like flight right radar and shipping radar and things like that are really good tools that they can sort of see how patterns change um, in terms of trade um, you'll notice there is a amazing case study in the book on China and Australia and it's uh, on China and it's looking at mining and the use of mining which is really relevant nowadays and production and consumption so back to that basics of globalization that you do in year, year seven or eight whenever you do it each time there's a great palm oil case study as well as even getting students to go look at products where do they come from where are they found what getting them to open up maybe a bathroom cupboard, looking at the back of the products. Where was it made? Where was the brand? Where was the company? Even things like that. <coughs> the teaching notes. Um, so basically you're not trying to show the interconnections between the four sections. As I was saying at the start, do it as two weeks of this, two weeks. Make it short, new, exciting topic each time whether you do it for two or three weeks. Um, Use different case studies and examples um, as a way to get the kids involved. Pick things that they're interested in um, and use it and look at it from a range of scales. No, no, not at all. Still, yeah, I did taught today, year eight, mountain, same as. <coughs> yeah, if only we were teaching it at the moment, so. So with the stage five, um, again, I've just put this in the order that it falls in the syllabus. So again, it's up to you and your programming where, where it all fits. So you can put them in any order you want. So you can start with human wellbeing and go all through. So again, there's that, that flexibility that you have to, to put them in whichever order. This is probably one of the favourite ones for me in terms of the, the new Stage 5 course because when you look at biomes, and I suppose it's because you, when you do the senior stuff you do ecosystems at risk and the kids seem to really enjoy the ecosystem sort of topic. So this is the, I think the preparation for those kids is really developing that good foundation of, of what are the characteristics of those biomes and, and how it all fits in. So, and again, like Christina says, we've got so many great tools that we can use with the biomes that you, again you can use your Google mapping and those sort of things to, to start to plan out and map out. The text has a whole heap of beautiful world maps with all the biomes over it so you can get the kids to interpret the biomes and, 
do a understanding of why they exist where they do. So there's a whole range of things that allow you to do that. Obviously, <coughs> changing, changing biomes, how are humans having an impact? I mean, you've got many, many examples that you can use from that. So again, it's up to you as the teacher. What do you think your kids are going to be interested in? Is it something that maybe at the local scale? Is it something happening around the corner? Or is it something global? Okay, you've got to make sure that you pitch these things at the, the level that your kids, the kids want. Obviously, agricultural yields and those sort of things <coughs> are really, really different. The big thing we've used is the green revolution there. So how that really changed the food production in Asia and, and had that big push for a lot of people. And you can sort of maybe tie that into some population human development sort of data as well, how that green revolution had a big impact on, on those. Obviously challenges of food production, uneven distribution of it, why we got certain areas that have oversupply of food and areas under supply of food. So again, that's that investigate. You can throw these sort of questions at the kids. Why does this occur? Put a question on the board or give them this question and say, why does this occur? You tell me why. It's not, and it's taken me a long time to get my head around this, that instead of being the teacher at the front and you're telling the kids what to do, it's now you're being the one to facilitate it and get them to be really part of the learning process. Get them to do a lot of the work for you. And the kids are really responding to that these days. I'll find at our school especially. And obviously food security. And again, what we've put up here are just the syllabus points straight out of the syllabus. But again, you can see world biomes to achieve sustainable food security for Australia and the world. So you have to touch on what's happening in Australia, what's going on here, and then maybe do a comparative study somewhere else in, in the world. So again, they're the sort of things, the key things that I've just sort of gone over. Again, that green revolution is, is, is a key, key concept there in terms of linking into that agricultural rise and how that's had an impact on biomes, the expansion of agriculture, the expansion of those needs for food supply. And obviously looking at a national level for food products, but then also looking at global resource. Australia is one of the biggest exporters of raw food around the world. So what happens to that? Why does that occur? So and again, there is that crossover with water in the world. Obviously, the, the access to the water has an impact on, on some of those things. So again, you're building on prior knowledge from the, from the kids. So say that to the kids when you're doing these things. What about, remember when we did this? How does this relate to this? So you're drawing that interconnection between what, what you've taught. Changing places. And again, this is, this is again, you've got, I think they've got the balance right with a lot of the syllabus. So you, biomes is that physical sort of geography. So now we're moving into that human sort of geography now. So looking at urbanisation all these key things about how places are changing all over the world. The key thing you can see there is it's, it really says with reference to one Asian country. What Asian country are you going to choose? What's the easiest one you're going to pick? China. Okay. The text has a lot of, lot of good stuff on China and it's, it's built that through. So again, it's the most easiest option Again, it's the most relevant option in terms of what's going on in, the, in our region at the moment and around the world. So again, build on kids' prior knowledge. They've probably heard things in the newspaper or news or whatever, but they don't probably fully understand it. So really build upon that, that and really deep, dig deep into it and, and give the kids those, those key things. Obviously, settlement patterns. Australia's a good example. Obviously, we've got high urbanisation. You can do comparative studies, flip them around. So you're comparing Australia with other countries, so you might do some that, that aren't as urbanised and give reasons why and do in some other places. So 
again, it's up to you as the teacher to really find what, what's going to suit your kids. The key thing again with the book and especially the chapter with this is the, the thread that goes through the, the internal migration. Again, and I, f I think when we, we did all the planning for this that by having that one case study that flows through, I think it helps the kids with their understanding. So if you have that China at the start, you can flow that through into the internal migration and international migration as well. So you can, can have that flowing through the whole theme. So have that thread through the whole lot. It's not to say you can't. If your kids are able to cope with multiple case studies, feel free, go and do a whole range of different things. But especially for us and boys, keep it simple, nice and linear, keep it nice and organised for them. So that's, that's what we've done in terms of our planning for that. And obviously Australia's urban future, use a whole range of things. Things like second airport at Badgerys Creek, you can go into something like that. So topical, so much going on, especially in this region, you've got a whole lot of pros and cons with it. Is it going to be beneficial or not? You can investigate how that's going to impact on the future of Sydney especially and the growth of in Western Sydney. So all the politicians are espousing all the benefits of it, but is that going to flow through into the, the areas of that area? So that's the sort of things that we're sort of looking at with that. So again, China's the, the easy option there. You can th flow through all the internal stuff. Obviously the factors that influence the migration into Australia, obviously refugees, employment, education. There's the Sydney airport. <coughs> this is probably one of the most interesting topics in, in year 10. When I sort of first started looking at this, I was just expecting this to be a a carbon copy of the Australian environments topic we teach at the moment. It was just going to be, right, this is where we're going to have to do our field work, this is where we're going to have to go and do this. But actually when you get into it and start to delve into it a little bit more, it's, it's yeah, it's very, very different to what it, what it was. So what, the first part of it is just going through environments in general. What are, what are the two, the roles of environments? Obviously, how are humans having an impact on it and what are they doing to manage it? So it's just a, a nice little introduction. So it gives, this is like an overview. You're giving an overview, much like when we did the current, current one where you had to do the overview of all the different issues in Australian environment. You had to do air quality, waste management, all those sort of things. So now, now they're moving into, this is the, the overview of these environments, how are humans impacting it, how are they managing it. And then you go into, you've got to select an environment and then compare it with somewhere else in the world. So it's, it's up to you to decide where you want to go with it. So again, it's, it's very flexible and very <coughs> easy to, to just understand, well, what do I want to do? Where do I want to go with this? You can in integrate field work into this if you want. But you sort of need to have that in mind. Obviously the, the go-to one would be coasts, okay, because there's a lot of information, a lot of resources out there about coasts. But again, how are you going to do a comparative study with coasts? Where, where else are you going to go that's going to give you? Would you go to Europe where you have the stony beaches and different processes than Australia? So. You've got to come up with the, a really good one I thought of was Alpine. I thought I was exploring that as an option and maybe taking our kids down to, down to the snow and looking at those as a, an environment. So there's, there's so many different things with this that you can do. I know a lot of rural people will do rivers because they have that accessibility. They can go there to the, the local river and, and look at it. If you are interested in doing rivers, the the United uh, UK Geographical Association do a whole heap of stuff on rivers over there, so use them as a resource if you want to, to do the, the rivers stuff. And again, you've got to address all those key syllabus points. Make sure you, you hit all your markers with what you're doing. So 
you've got to be able to make sure that it's, it's the right case study and the, the right fit. So again, this is this physical environment that we're, they're getting you to, to look at with this one. The last one we've got with the, the human wellbeing one <coughs> is, it reminds me a lot of, of the stuff that we do with the Year 11 course. That sort of little bit of development geography, trying to tie in things into it. And you're looking at wellbeing and development. And the key thing with this is looking at it from a global perspective, but then you've also got human wellbeing in Australia as well. So you've got to look at, look at that. And again, a good example would probably be your Indigenous communities, looking at the differences between Indigenous and non-Indigenous, <coughs> access to healthcare and those sort of things that go on with this. So it's a, it's a really good topic in terms of getting the kids to understand some of the, the key human development indicators and, and what's going on. And, and the, probably the, the biggest thing for me is this one here in terms of, well, what's being done to, to solve this? What's some of the initiatives and, and those sort of things? So you can maybe do an inquiry-based approach and get the kids to evaluate, get them to think of that higher level that would be something at a senior sort of level. Challenge the kids to evaluate what are these processes, how successful have they been, okay? So it's a good way to, to introduce the kids into that, maybe the senior, senior curriculum. It's really good for spatial development. You can use the Google Maps and those sort of things to put all your data in and do analysis. You can do case studies from your local area about <coughs> health issues and management issues that have been going on. And obviously, like I said before, evaluate government initiatives, that child immunisation. How successful has that been? You've got conscientious objectors and people that weren't getting their kids immunised and then there's outbreaks of certain diseases that were supposed to be covered. I know as a parent, it's when you send your kid to daycare, the last thing you want to, them to get is some of these things coming back. So it's, a, it's quite an interesting sort of topic that you can use and there's a lot of media stuff that you can use to help you with that. The last thing I wanted to go through quite quickly, I know time's running out, is the, the interactive teacher edition. And <coughs> and this is basically a one-stop shop for teachers, okay? This has, has everything in it. You've got programs, you've got scope and sequences, you've got assessment tasks, you've got the textbook, you've got teaching strategies, you've got everything in here. So you go to, this is just the, the first sort of unit that they've done up, and this is the, <laughs> sort of the title page for Water in the World. And as you scroll down, you can see you've got your scope and sequence, and that's the same as what we've done. And this is all in the one thing. So you have access to everything in here. You've got the teaching program. So this is like what you've got in your, your book, but it goes through the whole teaching program and links it all together. Okay. Then you scroll down. As you scroll down through it, You've got each of the chapters, so you've got the textbook here. You've got the syllabus table that shows how it's done, and then you just click across the bottom, hopefully. Doesn't want to work. And what each one has, has each of the aspects of the book. And these are, you've got each of the activities,
And these are some really good little features. So if you get these sort of things, and these are interactives. I know it's, it's pretty small to see up there, but it's a simple little chloropleth map, but this is a really good way to go through and explain chloropleth maps to stage four kids. <coughs> so you can click on the ones down the bottom, and then that just brings them up to show where each of it is. So you could have this teacher version stick it up onto your, your data projector or on your board and then show this to the kids and show, well, this is how this works and get them to interpret it. You can teach th through this. So, and you can see the photos and, and all the stuff that's in there. You've got activities and each of these, each of these activities are downloadable, so you can download them. I don't know which that one I think it was. <laughs> and they're all in Word format. So all the teacher activities throughout the whole book are there in Word format. So you can cut these out, put these as Word, as <coughs> activity sheets for the kids, print them out, and the kids can sit there and, and work through the work through the book. And again, you've got interactive videos there, so it's a little video that goes through showing how a cold front works. I won't go through that for you. But again, see, like Christina was talking about, the Murray-Darling Basin. You've got the key case studies there. And again, another interactive map. You've got nice little photo arrays that you can use as visual representations and get them to interpret what's going on in each one. And what, probably the key, key part to this whole series and what we've designed up is each of these key learning. And basically what we've done is when you saw the scope and sequence and there's all those lessons, what we've done <coughs> is write lessons for everyone. So you have the complete, if you wanted to, you have the complete unit topic, lesson by lesson by lesson with activities in there ready to go. So these can be downloaded. So these are the little lesson by lesson activities. <coughs> so you have the map there and then it goes into interpret the maps and that's a whole lesson worth of information ready to go for you. So it's a lesson by lesson focus for the whole, whole topic. And that, that's done for the whole textbook. So for each of those scope and sequences, for each unit, every lesson is accounted for. So you have a lesson by lesson approach to the whole, <coughs> whole book. So for programming purposes, you could have that whole thing done based on what we've done in that book. So you can see there, and it relates to each part of the book. So as you go down, this book has so this section has your three learning act, four learning activities. You go down to the next one. So there's key learning 13.5. And again, you can see what we've built into it for teachers. Concept, sustainability and change. So you've got those concepts. How do you think the availability of water in the future will be affected if the current trend of population increase continues? Look at China, India, Brazil as key countries. So we've got these activities built in there for you to use as part of your programming and, and those. And all those things are downloadable. You can have worksheets, you can do the whole lot. So it's, it's a really good way. This chapter doesn't have it, but we've also written assessment tasks. There's assessment tasks in there for you with marking criteria. Everything's in there. So you can see how much work's gone into this, but in saying that, this has been written by teachers, for teachers in New South Wales. We know what you need, we know what is there, so outcomes, all that stuff is in your assessment task, the marking criteria, everything's there for you. So we have written this specifically for you guys, so that you can use as much or as little as what you want 
out of that whole thing. So it's, it's really flexible for you. It's really, we've integrated a whole range of different learning activities in there. Christine has put a lot of visual thinking stuff in there. We've put in a different range of different strategies. So it's, it's really well set up for you to just go through it all, look at it and use as much or as little as you want. But again, that whole resource there, you've got the textbook, you've got everything, the scope and sequence, the programs, it's all put in a seamless little unit of work there. It's all accessed through the, the Cambridge Go website and it, it's, it's a really, really useful tool for, for teachers. So when it becomes available, you'll be able to, to have a lot of fun with it.